Okay, we're starting a new chapter today. This is chapter 10. It's entitled States of Matter, and we begin by a discussion on the kinetic molecular theory of matter. Now, basically, what the kinetic molecular theory of matter is saying that is that all particles, now those particles can be um, molecules, atoms, or ions are in constant motion. Now, uh, your book lists uh, five postulates to this theory, or five parts to this theory, and I want you to compare the ones that I'm about to give you um, to those found on pages 329 to 330 of your text. So compare these to the five mentioned in your book. Um, so compare to those in your text. Pages 329 to 330. Uh, I expand mine just a little bit. So number one, all matter is composed of small particles. Um, as stated above, molecules, atoms, or ions. The molecules of gases are specifically separated from their neighbors by distances much greater than the size of the individual molecule. So between gas particles there are huge distances. Number three, the volume of the individual molecule turns out to be so small that the molecule itself, that volume, is considered to be insignificant compared to the volume that the gas occupies. Number four, uh, the particles are in constant random straight line motion and they continue to move in this straight line until they collide with other particles or the walls of their container. Uh, the collisions are elastic. That simply means that there's no change in the total kinetic energy between the two particles before and after they collide with each other or the walls of their container. Number six, the average kinetic energy is the same for all molecules so long as the temperature is the same. Now the key word here is the average kinetic energy and we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes on the next page of our notes. This kinetic energy is directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature. Now that's a new temperature scale and we're going to talk about that, um, introduce that in this chapter and use it for the remainder of the year. So once again the kinetic energy is directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature of the substance. Now let's first list a few properties of gases, then we'll list a few properties of liquids and get a few vocabulary terms out of the way. Now, uh, your book in chapter 10 begins talking a little bit about gases and lists some properties. I'm just going to write a few of them down. Number one, as you probably already know, gases are easily compressed. There is so much distance between these molecules that we can actually push them together and compress them so that those molecules are closer together. Number two, um, gases occupy the volume of their container. So if the container is two liters and you have a gas in there, it will occupy the entire two liters. If that container is one liter and you have the same amount of gas in there, it will occupy a volume of one liter, and so on. Number three, uh, as mentioned earlier, there's large distances between gas particles, so they have a very low density. And number four, um, the particles can slide past one another, so we say that gases flow easily. Now, when we get to chapter 11, we're going to talk more specifically about real gases versus ideal gases. Now, the difference between a real gas and an ideal gas is, is, is that real gases tend to be attracted a little bit to one another. So they take on um, some liquid properties. So the difference between a real gas and an ideal gas is that real gases have an attraction or an attractive force. So they tend to 
um, get a little bit closer to each other than we'd like. Well, than what we would like to, uh, for an ideal gas to behave. So real gases are attracted a little bit to each other. They take on oh, some liquid properties, particularly when the temperature gets low and the pressure gets high. They start behaving more and more like a liquid. Now, liquids, um, let's list a few of their properties. And you're going to see that there are some that are similar to gases. Number one, they have a definite volume. So they don't necessarily occupy the volume of their container. As you well know, if we have um, a two liter bottle and we pour one liter of a liquid in there, the volume will be one liter. It won't occupy the entire volume of the container um, like gases would. Uh, liquids have no definite shape, so they take the shape of their container. So take shape of the container that they're in. Number three, um, they cannot be compressed as easily as gases. So I'm just going to write, they cannot be compressed. Now that really isn't completely true, but the amount of compression is so minimal, we're going to say it's negligible. So we're going to say that liquids, the particles are so close to each other that it's hard to push them closer to, uh, together than they already are. And their particles can slide past each other just like gas particles can. So liquids flow easily just like gases. And of course, as you well know, some liquids flow more, flow more easily than other liquids. Now, a couple of vocabulary terms we need to get out of the way. Uh, number one is something called surface tension. Now, if you look this up in your book, it says something like this. It says, the force that pulls um, adjacent parts of a liquid surface together. So the force that's pulling liquid molecules towards each other, that's called surface tension. Now this causes things like droplets of water or droplets of a liquid to take on a spherical shape. That spherical shape allows them to occupy the smallest volume possible because they're being pulled towards each other. Another vocabulary term that you actually might be familiar with is something called vaporization. And so vaporization is simply a process by which a liquid or solid changes to a gas. Now I know my handwriting isn't spectacular here, but if you listen carefully to the recording, uh, you should be able to make out what this says. If not, just go ahead and stop it and rewind and, and you can play it over again and you can complete your notes. Alright, another vocabulary term is something called vapor pressure. And vapor pressure is simply the pressure exerted <clears throat> by a vapor um, in equilibrium. Now that's a big word and we're going to talk about that more uh, throughout this unit. In equilibrium with its corresponding liquid. So I'm just going to put with its liquid. So vapor pressure is the pressure exerted by a vapor in equilibrium with its corresponding liquid. Now we have a couple of pictures. One here is a picture of uh, gas in a container and a liquid in a container. Now of course these uh, particles represent molecules or atoms and they're really not that big. It's just to help us visualize um, that gases take up the entire volume of their container and there's large distances between the particles. Liquid particles occupy a definite volume of their container and the particles are very, very close to each other. So we said earlier that gases can be compressed. Liquids, because the particles are so close, the compression is very, very minimal.
Now, in a given sample of a liquid at a given temperature, the average kinetic energy of all molecules is constant. Now, in actual fact, the actual kinetic energy of the individual molecules varies greatly. Now, that sounds a bit confusing, but I hope to clear that up for you in just a sec. Now, in order for a molecule in the liquid to evaporate, so in order for it uh, to vaporize, as we said earlier, um, so in order for it to be in the vapor or gaseous state, the molecule must meet two conditions. So number one, the particle must be on the surface of the liquid. And number two, it must have um, enough kinetic energy, and I'm going to write Ke for kinetic energy, to escape the attractive forces of its neighbors. So I'm going to say to escape the attractive forces of the neighboring molecules. So it's got to be on top and it has to have a minimal amount of energy to be able to escape the attractive forces of the neighboring molecules. Now it turns out that only a certain number of molecules have enough energy to escape the attractive forces of their neighboring molecules and of course evaporate. Now we're going to look at this graph in just a minute. Yet a drop of water will completely evaporate if left undisturbed on a tabletop. How do these other molecules acquire the needed energy to evaporate? In other words, where does the energy come from? Well, I'm going to say simply from the surroundings. Let's take a look at this graph over here. Now, um, T2 is this darker line right here, and that is a temperature that's higher than T1, which is this lighter line right here. Now this arrow represents the minimal energy needed to evaporate. So the molecules have to have at least that much energy to be able to evaporate. Now of course they also need to be on the surface of the liquid, but they also have to have that amount of energy. Now you'll notice that um, the, uh, the kinetic energy of individual molecules vary greatly. At the lower temperature, some molecules have this much kinetic energy. Well, some also have this much kinetic energy. So it's interesting to note that the average kinetic energy remains constant right here, but some have low energy, some have high. Let me give you an example. Um, let's say that my class takes a test or a quiz, and the average on that quiz is 17 out of 20. Does that mean that everybody got a 17 out of 20? Of course not. Some of the students may have gotten a 1 or 2 or 3 out of 20. Other students may have gotten a 20 out of 20. So, some particles in a liquid on the liquid surface might have a lot of energy. Some might have a little. But at a particular temperature, the average remains constant. Now notice, as the temperature increases, so that's this darker line here, the average kinetic energy increases and more molecules have the energy required to escape the surface of the liquid. So over time, if I were to observe a droplet of water, there's a really bad picture of a tabletop with a droplet of water sitting on, its, uh, on the surface of the tabletop, some of these molecules on the surface might have enough energy to evaporate. Okay, they would be those over here. Now once they leave, won't other molecules below the surface be able to take their place? And eventually, since the average kinetic energy stays constant, once this guy leaves, if the average remains constant, some others have to gain energy, and they get that energy from the surroundings. So eventually all the molecules, if that kinetic energy remains constant, will be able to have enough energy to escape the surface of the liquid. Once again, those that leave have high energy. Those that remain behind have lower energy. So in reality, evaporation is a cooling process. 
which is quite interesting. Evaporation, if you think of getting out of the swimming pool on a hot summer day, even though it's 90 degrees outside, you might shiver. Well, why are you shivering? Well, because evaporation is occurring. The molecules of water on the surface of the droplets of water on your body leave. Now, which ones leave? Well, those with high energy. What does that leave behind? Those with low energy. So, these with low energy eventually have the energy to evaporate. Where does that energy come from? From the surroundings, which happens to be your body. So your body can transfer that heat to those molecules. They can increase in their kinetic energy, so the average stays the same, and eventually be able to evaporate. Now, it is possible for a gaseous particle that has evaporated to collide with the surface of the liquid it left. If its kinetic energy is low enough at the time of the collision, that particle may be again uh, may again become part of the liquid. However, if it comes from a container is op that is open, there's little chance of this happening. So if that droplet of water is in my room, once that molecule leaves, is it likely to return to the surface? Probably not. If it's in a sealed container, it'll eventually bump around throughout that container, maybe hit the walls of the container, but it'll eventually hit the surface of the liquid. If its kinetic energy is low enough, it can condense. It can become a liquid once more. So, that's what we say on the top of this next page. In a closed container, the chance of this type of collision increases. In fact, a point is reached where just as many molecules of a gas return as leave the surface of a liquid. In a closed container, the rate at which the molecules evaporate equals the rate at which the molecules condense. So, the particles that are liquid are becoming gaseous, and notice this arrow goes both ways. The gas particles are returning to their liquid phase. So this symbol means that they've reached what we call an equilibrium. So if we take a look at this picture here, this is a dome covering a beaker full of water. Initially, the particles are all leaving the surface. But if that's a sealed dome, some of those particles will eventually come back to the surface of the liquid and condense. Eventually, I'm going to reach a point where the number of particles that are in the vapor state remains constant, because some of those are returning back to the liquid phase as some of those leave. We say this is an equilibrium condition. It is a special type of equilibrium called dynamic equilibrium. Okay, and that will wrap up the first part of our lecture on chapter 10. Uh, the next part of our discussion will be on something called Le Chatier's Principle. Um, stay tuned, that's coming soon. So thanks for your time.